Hello, good friends on Franklin Gateway and anywhere else who wants to listen to this. Yes, I'm Wilma Zalabach. I'm the one who was known for preaching on the street on Franklin Gateway. I want you, my friends, to know that I still pray for you. And though I see only some of you uh, some of the time, I look forward every time to when I see you. Um, I understand there may be a back to school bash yet during August. So I hope you uh, look out for the notices of that. It's done by the Franklin Road Community Association. So today our topic is about hidden things, things that get done uh, that are done in secret or something like that. So um, we will start with Matthew 13. And it will be a long reading, I'll warn you that, because I want to read for you the whole chapter, Matthew 13. But before we read, we want to pray. O oh Lord God in heaven, you, the ruler of the universe, have prepared for us your word. And we ask that you will meet us here and help us to understand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will read Matthew 13. This is uh, the third sermon that Jesus preached, uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Sort of the center of the book, if you look at it that way. This is Jesus talking, only Matthew gives a little bit of narrative at the beginning. Matthew 13 starting at verse 1. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear? Let him listen. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you talk to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Behold, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever has to him will be given, and he will have more abundance. But whoever has not from him will be taken away, even what he has. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, See not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear and not understand, and seeing you will see and will not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say to you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Therefore hear ye the parable of the sower. When any one hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is the one who received seed by the wayside. But the one who received seed into stony places, the same is the one who hears the word and with joy receives it. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is the one who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. 
But the one who received seed into the good ground is the one who hears the word and understands it, who also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares, the weeds also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then has it brought forth weeds? And he said to, to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the, t the weeds, you'll root up also the wheat with them. But both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather together first the tares, the weeds, and bind them in bundles to burn them. <clears throat> but gather the wheat into my barn. Other parable he told them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable he gave them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not talk to them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Tell us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered and said to them, The one who sows good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the weeds are the children of the wicked one. The enemy has, that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So therefore, the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and will cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then will the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him listen. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hid in a field, which when a man found, he hid it, and for joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking, seeking goodly pearls, who when he's found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So will it be at the end of the world. The angels will come forth and sever the wicked from among the dust and will cast them into the furnace of fire there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe who is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. That's the reading of the word, Matthew 13, verses 1 to 52. And now let's ponder it a little bit. Redlining. 
was a hidden decision and strategy. You see, where a family lives determines what food and natural resources are available, what schools the children will attend, and how soon the vehicles will wear out. For many years after the Civil War, decisions were made and multiplied among real estate professionals and bankers to show black and white people homes in different sectors. On circulated maps, red lines showed the difference. Because of hidden decisions and strategies like redlining, we now have whole sectors where access to healthy food and robust schools is limited. Please don't misunderstand me. I know most realtors are compassionate and considerate and deserve the trust of their customers. But the fact is that we have today segregated and neglected neighborhoods and people who are not shown or funded for something better. It's hard for a nation to correct the hidden strategies. Somewhere in hidden meetings, long prison terms were mandated for the crimes common to people of color or people of few resources. So black men stay incarcerated rather than being soon back with their families, raising children to avoid black people's crimes, in prison rather than getting back to work soon, behind bars rather than voting and driving their kids to soccer games. It's hard for a nation to correct hidden strategies. Eugenics is a hidden word today, sometimes not so hidden, maybe. Our nation's studies on eugenics were shared with Hitler. Our nation's studies on eugenics are the historical seedbed of Planned Parenthood with new clinics thriving in black neighborhoods. Again, I, don't misunderstand me. I'm well aware that access to abortion has brought freedom to millions of women. But the fact is that black babies die in abortion at a higher rate than white babies do. It's hard for a nation to correct hidden strategies. But let me tell you some good news, because what I hear sounds to me like something maybe like a jubilee. Doug Chris of CNN recounts how in May 2019, billionaire Robert Smith announced his offer to pay off all the college debt of the graduating class at Morehouse College, a historically black college in Atlanta. More than 400 graduates from Morehouse's class of 2019, as well as their parents and guardians, will have their student loans paid. From the $34 million that Smith donated for the purpose. Darren Walker, president of Ford Foundation, writes, for the first time in Ford's history, the Board of Trustees has authorized up to $1 billion financed through the sale of bonds to help stabilize and strengthen the nonprofit sector. Essentially, Ford Foundation is borrowing money to give away. Andy Medici of the Atlanta Business Chronicle writes, PayPal Incorporated has joined the growing chorus asking the Small Business Administration to automatically forgive all Paycheck Protection Program loans below a certain amount. And I understand that went through this week. Not all hidden decisions are troubling. There are also decisions being made in boardrooms and in human minds that speak of jubilee. Hidden decisions and strategies have been planted for the kingdom of heaven. There's something hidden in the parables of Matthew 13. There are seven parables in Matthew 13, maybe eight, depending on which scholar you read. Hidden is a repeated word, not used in all of them, but a possible descriptor for each of them. For hiddenness 
purposes here, we will let the flagship parable, the one of the sower, stand alone. We'll come back to it in a minute. Here are the other six. The weeds were planted under cover of night. The mustard seed was hidden in the field. The yeast was hidden in the flour. The treasurer was found hidden in a field. The pearl had to be searched for. The fish in the net were not known. Yet Jesus asked his hearers, his disciples, do you understand? I think Jesus meant for us to understand. He said, anyone trained in the kingdom of heaven will bring things new and old out of his hidden treasure. So the kingdom of heaven is hidden. Or at least has something hidden about it. Let us notice here that the thing hidden was not always considered good. The weeds were planted by the enemy. The mustard seed is an opportunist not wanted by many, many farmers. The yeast is a symbol in the Bible of corruption and sin. So we can see that the kingdom of heaven is hidden and puzzling in its beginning maybe even of dubious origins. The kingdom is also fruitful, astonishingly, shockingly fruitful. The sower gathered in some instances 10,000% return on investment. When 1,000% ROI was considered normal. The weeds hinder the wheat were no match for the master's strategies. The mustard seed, at most meant to grow 12 feet tall, grew instead to be a great tree reaching the sky, and beloved by birds and other creatures for nesting. The yeast spread and permeated the whole 150 pounds of flour. The treasure was so vast, the finder was gladly willing to sell everything he had to acquire it. The pearl was worth so much that the merchantman searched long and far for it, then sold everything he had to buy it. The net caught many fish of all kinds. The one trained in the kingdom of heaven brings out of his treasure not only the old, but also the new. So the kingdom of heaven is fruitful, astonishingly shockingly fruitful. Indeed, the gospel of the kingdom did cover the earth during the century in which Jesus lived. Now I will show you how the kingdom of heaven is people. Jesus gave explicit explanations of only three of these seven or eight parables. So according to Jesus, the sower planted the word of God in people. The weeds and wheat are children of the kingdom or of another ruler. In either case, they are people. The fish in the net are people described similarly to the people in the weeds and wheat story. So since these three parables clearly speak of people, let's use this fact as context for the interpretation of the other parables. Here we go. The mustard seed is kingdom people set in a certain place and becoming large enough to bless many others. The yeast is kingdom people mixed in with the world and they grow to permeate the whole world. The treasure is people whom Jesus found and bought with everything and who bring to Jesus great joy. The pearl shows the worth of one person for whom Jesus came in search. The one trained in the kingdom is every disciple of Christ, every kingdom person sharing the things he or she knows, looking for that hidden treasure, searching for that costly pearl, the people of the kingdom. So the kingdom of heaven is hidden. That's number one, hidden. And number two, amazingly fruitful. And number three, it is people. 
The people of the kingdom harbor the word and persevere. They bless others and fill the earth. They bring joy to Jesus' heart because he came a long way to find them. They meet troubles and have no part in sorting or judging other people. Recognizing that the kingdom of heaven is people, all kinds of people, gives me ballast for the decision to love all people as Jesus longs. Jesus came all that way for a relationship with people, not for a relationship of two crossbeams of wood, not for a relationship with some complicated belief system or worldview. Jesus came such a long way to find people aware of his presence. Mar Tisby in his book, The Color of Compromise, highlights how the Negro spirituals demonstrate an awareness of God from which we could learn much. They sing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Or, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. They also sing, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. And, did my Lord deliver Daniel? And why not every man? They made these songs to sing every day teaching each generation to be aware, always, of the presence of a real God of power and protection and deliverance. The kingdom of heaven is hidden, but hidden for good results. The kingdom of heaven is fruitful beyond all expectation. The kingdom of heaven is people, sometimes hidden, eventually very fruitful, and always beloved by Jesus. So I want to pray for us. I want to pray for you. And during the prayer, I invite you to get in your mind the people you care about, the people you know of who are struggling in some way. Put them in your mind. And while we pray, place them before our God. O oh Lord Almighty, we come to you as the ruler of the universe, the one who gets to tell the sea how far to come and the night and day how to work, the one who gets to drive all the various galaxies so they don't run into each other. We come to you also as a loving father, as the one who searched for us, went to all lengths to search for us and found us. So we come to you recognizing you and praising you, aware of your presence in this very place, wherever we are worshiping you at the moment. We want to be more aware of your presence, and we realize that many things shut out that awareness often. We get so carried away with, things that have to be done and, and the troubles of the pandemic and uh, unfairness in our world. We, we just let our minds focus on the news. I did that yesterday and I realized I'd been done too much news. Lord, that happens so often with us. I ask that you will open up our minds to know your presence. I ask that you will alert our minds to the joys of the kingdom of heaven, to the joys of loving you and, and of reading your word. Lord, 
we confess that we often fall short of loving you and loving our neighbors. We ask for your forgiveness and we claim it under the blood of Jesus Christ because he died for our sins. And in that gratitude, in that thankfulness for your forgiveness, we come boldly to your throne right now, expecting that you will hear our requests and move in to help. There are those of us who know people who are sick or terribly depressed. We lift those up to you right now for you to reach and comfort and heal. There are those we know who are having financial difficulties, struggling maybe because of COVID things or maybe for other reasons. Lord, we come to you as the one who has all resources. And we lift up the names of those who are struggling in that way. And Lord, there are some we know who are struggling about career, making money, uh, having a, a uh, office situation or a work situation where people get along and love each other, I ask, Lord, that as we lift up the, the names of those, that you will work in their own hearts and in the hearts of those around them to be aware of your presence and your love and therefore to be able to love each other. Lord, I ask especially that you'll be with our children Many children have had a hard time through this uh, coronavirus, either missing terribly their friends at school or even maybe being in abusive situations at home. Oh, Lord, please come into the hearts of those children. Teach them your love. Teach them that you love them more than anyone else ever could. And as our school leaders seek to plan school openings for the fall, I so ask that you will sit in our board rooms, that you will uh, be across the wires as people are talking and, and uh, talking by Zoom, making decisions for our children. I so ask that you will have your way in our schools this fall. Lord, I ask for our fellow churches. There are several churches on Franklin Gateway or near. I ask that you would especially bless them, that as people determine that they need to get into church, that you will teach these churches to welcome them and bring them your word and share their testimonies and their love. I ask that you will keep your churches so that they can continue to minister for you according to your will. And Lord, there are these two big things that I pray for each week here. There's the coronavirus. And so many, many, many confusing pieces about it. I so ask that you will be with every one of my friends, everyone who's watching this video, that we might have wisdom to, to move, to take steps according to what really will make a difference. And I ask that you would watch over those who are working for virus or working for the, the medication that could help us. I ask that you will open doors for these people that um, your spirit will be at work on earth. But Lord, during this stay-at-home time, during this confusing time, I do ask that you will use all of our emotions, all of our deprivations to draw us to you. I ask that the extra time will be spent in your word. I ask that the extra longing will find its way toward you and that you will re-honor and respect that longing. 
Lord, and then there's the other thing, the, the injustices, the unfairness of our world. And the recognition that our world is set for success for one race and not success for another. Oh, Lord, I ask that you will, uh, what, turn the tables upright, upright our systems, work in the people who are making decisions that that the uh, sadness the the discrimination the the terror the the disaster to to people might be renounced and and rescinded and and helped delayed uh, brought to some sort of uh, reconciliation and and reparations oh lord i ask that you will walk us through this inhumanity to our fellow humans that you will grant those making decisions to have love that you will grant those who have hunted for a way through for so many years, I, I ask that you will grant them a way through. And Lord, for most of us, all of us, I think, grant us not only love, but deep forgiveness a way through. And if I've said something here that offends someone, you know I would feel sad. So I ask that you will cover this video with your hands, this prayer with your hands, that the devil not be able to get a hold of it and take it to ruin something. Lord, I thank you. I honor and glorify you because you are the one in charge. You are the one that we call on to swing low and carry us home, to keep your eye on us as you do the little sparrow. So we honor and praise and glorify your name. And we know we'll be doing that through all eternity. So we do it now. Lifting up your name, your glory, your mission on high. And we do this forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm Wilma Zollebach, and I'm going to try to share this screen with you so that we can walk through the good things. There it is. I'm Wilma Zollebach. I'm the preacher on the street. I'm also pastor of Grace Chapel Fellowship. And I work in a couple other churches around here. You can find Grace Chapel Fellowship by website and Facebook. In fact, if you put my name in, just Wilma Zollebach, you will. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that disappears all the time. But we got it back. If you search for us on web website and Facebook, you'll find us. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches. Where listening is our unity. And yes, you'll find that I have six enduring themes. Themes: God is good. Humans have been taken away from God. Jesus came to bring us back. And I can say God can, I can't, and I decide to let God. Number five, the Bible is worth reading. And number six, the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.